Hey, Nets fans, on game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. When cooking isn't in the cards, go Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. Get your food delivered on time at the lowest price with Grubhub. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. There's never been a better time for football fans to join the huddle with BetMGM. Sign up today and place a $10 pregame wager on any pro football team to win. If any player scores a touchdown in any pro football game, you'll win $200 in free bets regardless of your wager's outcome. Just use bonus code JERSEY200 when you make your first bet. Get on the field and find out why nothing beats a win with the king of sportsbooks. Download the app or go to BetMGM.com and use bonus code JERSEY200 to win $200 in free bets if any player scores a touchdown in any pro football game. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, people. Welcome to 2023 and more podcasts for you. Thank you so much for downloading the last episode, which was the best of 2022 with my good friends, Joey Cahill and Jeremy Bohm. This, you love lists. Everybody loves lists. <laughs> and I really, it makes me, it warms my soul to see the uh, positive response from people just like simply sharing music. And I, I love to hear that. So thank you very much. That's how we ended the year and how we begin the year is a great guest. This is an all-timer for me just because he plays in a band that uh, is looms large within my musical history, and uh, you've heard me opine and speak about them in the past. This is Todd Kowalski from Propagandi. He also played in an incredible band called I Spy. Revenge of the Little Shits is probably one of the best-named album titles I've ever heard, but um, yeah, Todd... Great bassist, great human being. Just allowed me to uh, punish him on Instagram to be like, "Hey, do you want to come on the show?" Like I, you know, I've I've had your bandmates, uh, Chris Chris Hanna, and then uh, one of your ex old bandmates, John K. Sampson, which I am actually very proud to say that I think I'm one of the only podcasts he's ever done, <laughs> and I, I wear that as a badge of pride. Anyways, but uh, Todd has done podcasts before, and he's a great hang and a great chat because. Uh, he's an interesting person, does a lot of art. If you follow him on Instagram and I will include a link to his Instagram in the show notes, you're able to see a lot of the uh, cool visual art and medium that he, uh, traffics in besides being a shredding bass player. So Todd and I go deep. We talk about prairie life and a bunch of other things, but I'm very excited to bring that chat to you. Some, some news and notes, I have actually launched an auxiliary podcast to this one because Lord knows we need more podcasts, especially from nerds like me. But uh, I wanted to do something a little bit uh, off the beaten path in regards to, you know, I reserve interviews for these besides the best of 2022 and then some other divergent ideas that I may have. But I wanted to contain more less conventional episodes on a separate feed. So I have finally got up my butt and launched it. It is a Spotify exclusive because I play full songs in these episodes, which like legally, you know, like I, I want to uh, live by the letter of the law. So technically I wouldn't be allowed to do that in these episodes, but I can do that. And if it's on Spotify, it's a whole thing. If you really care about it, you can email me, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com, and I can explain to you <laughs> the legality and intricacies of that. But anyways, I will include a link to this auxiliary podcast. It's called More On That. You can find it on Spotify. It's going to take a you know few days to matriculate and spread to the world to where the search algorithms. But if you want a very easy link to click, I will include that in the show notes here and moving forward. I'm probably going to do, I don't know, one episode a month, some 
something like that. I'm going to do some label retrospectives, just again, some other ideas in which I can play music and just, you know, be able to share more interesting or at least what I define interesting (laughs) things to you, the listener. But I got that. Like I said, you can always email the show, 100 words podcast at gmail.com. You can also it's not going to take you any effort besides maybe 30 to 40 seconds of your time to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or a star review rating on Spotify. That helps the show get some legitimacy and helps the algorithm, all those other things. I hope your holiday was good. Mine was great. Was able to disconnect, unplug, whatever, be able to, you know, read some books, watch some programs, play some board games, put together some puzzles, no traveling, was able to lock it down and just enjoy the time. So hopefully your holiday was great. And then, you know, whatever New Year's resolutions or whatever people do in the new year, I hope that's like killing it for you or something. I don't know. I I don't really care about uh, New Year's (laughs) as a holiday or as a, uh, idea to, you know, change yourself and, you know, reform and et cetera, et cetera. But anyways, if you believe in that, awesome. I'm just not really one for that. But let's dive into my discussion with Todd Kowalski from Propagandi and iSpy. Oh my gosh, I, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I've almost collected the whole band. I need to get Sue Lin and yeah, some other people. Uh, but yes, Todd is on the show and here we go. You know, I first ran across you via I Spy with the split that you did, obviously, with the band that you play in currently. Mm-hmm. And I, I was really, uh, being from Southern California, which is uh, where I reside, I, I was taken by the fact that, you know, another band in the same area had, you know, a, a similar idea and approach to obviously what Propagandi was doing. And honestly, at that time, like in the, you know, mid 90s when you were finding out about multiple bands from the same area it was like kind of finding a, a secret where i was like oh my gosh like <laughs> here's this other band that exists in the area oh, yeah. um, did it, it, it around that time like you know as i spy was just you know getting out there and playing shows and stuff like that uh did it feel vibrant to you like your local scene the fact that you know there was a, a lot of stuff going on or was it you know kind of just you guys existing there alongside of a few other people uh, I think it was, yeah, I, I think it was felt vibrant. Like there's Red Fisher, Propagandi, I Spy. Uh, uh, well, I was brand new to Winnipeg. I'm from Regina, actually, which is eight hours away. Right. So everything kind of seemed fresh and new. There was this band, House of Pancakes, I liked. And yeah, just kind of a bunch of bands in Winnipeg that uh, just seemed more open-minded in that than what I grew up with in Regina. I suppose, like it just seemed fresh and interesting to me. Sure. Sure. And just the, the fact that you were able to experience a, you know, scene in general, I'm sure from rather than what your experience was in Regina. Yeah, for sure. And like, uh, like Regina is pretty small and like isolated from almost everything in the world, especially when there was, uh, no internet at the time. So I right. like it seemed that, uh, Winnipeg was good for shows. Uh, and I remember on an MDC record or something, they thanked Winnipeg in particular. So I was kind of excited to get there and see what was up. Sure. <laughs> I do like those little breadcrumbs that get, you know, whether it's a friend's band that plays a show in some random town and is like, oh man, you got to hit Bloomington, Indiana. And yeah. you're just like, so it's like little crumbs that you hold on to, or it's like, oh yeah, can't wait to get to this, you know, random town in the, you know, North America or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I remember actually propaganda getting home from their first tour talking about, you know, you got to play in like Sheboygan, Wisconsin is awesome. (laughs) 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 Totally. And I I do like the fact that especially when it takes, I mean, to your point where, you know, Regina, Winnipeg, like, those are places that take effort to get to you. you, yeah. you it's not like you just pass through it on your way to Chicago or whatever. You have to specifically go there. So I yeah. think that the bands that did come through and play shows in your general area, you, you were more enamored to them because you're like, you came here. Like that took <laughs> a lot of effort to get here. 
Yeah, for sure. Like I, when I think of, uh, you know, I could think of like Sacrifice and Razor versus Slayer and Exodus and all these bands that never made it to Regina. Like I'm just, uh, I just have so much more connection to Sacrifice and Razor. Like even now, you know, the other bands are, oh, there's some bands from, like I like them a lot and I love them at the time, but like, you know, they're just other oh, California bands, whatever, but Razor and Sacrifice are like, yeah, they made it to Regina, you know? Right, right. And to that point, too, just the idea that you can also feel a little bit of ownership and honestly, how you guys have done it, where you've been able to shine a spotlight on those bands that, I mean, I, as a more punk and hardcore kid, like metal, I was always aware of and paid attention to it, but never to the point where I would ever find out about Razor or Sacrifice if it wasn't for you guys, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, of course, we're into the punk bands, too, but like, even a lot of Canadian punk bands didn't make it to Regina or Saskatoon. So yeah, you know, the bands I loved, Guild Parade, I don't think they made it to Winnipeg. I, they never made it as far as Regina, as far as I know, and stuff like that. But that's why uh, even SNFU and No Means No, all the kind of Western Canadian bands always stay strong for me. Uh, I actually saw them, and they were amazing. And then... Like when I actually ended up seeing like a lot of the American bands, I was like, they're just not as good. Like they're 10 times more as popular, but it's like, like not in every case, but in some case, it's just like, yeah, this band's not as good. Like I'd see Beyond Possession from Calgary, it just fucking destroyed me. And then you see like another band or so, you know, and that's super popular. And it's just like, ah, Beyond Possession, kick their ass. Right. <laughs> it's like they just wanted that more, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I, I think it's just, or it just spoke to me more, maybe because we're all prairie people or so, I don't know, you know? Sure, maybe sure. It could just be me, I don't know. <laughs> well, and speaking of uh, prairie people, just that idea that, uh, you know, I know, like you mentioned, you were born and raised in Regina. And I think most people, especially in uh, America and the States, they think of the middle of Canada as just like an absolute mystery. It's just like, yeah. maybe it's ice, maybe it's people hanging out with, you know, moose. It's just like, it, it's still, you know, even now that we clearly have the internet and many ways to tra- travel to these places. Um would you describe your, uh, I guess your, you know, being raised in Regina to be that kind of like really rural, you know, snow bound experience, or is that just like a complete oversimplification? Uh, it's a, well, there's summer, uh, Regina and Saskatchewan or that area is extremely uh, harsh in every way. Cause the summers are hot. There's no hills. There's hardly any lakes. Uh, there is lakes, but you know, like not around the city. And then, yeah, the summer's scorching. Like in the eighties, it was just infested with uh, grasshoppers. So, like, I never really realized how harsh Regina is until I got to Winnipeg, and it's it's cold. Like it gets forty something below, but nothing ever quite feels as as desolate as uh, like complete flat frozen prairie with like no tall buildings, you know? Yeah. (laughs) And I I think that's really um, respective of people's, you know, points of view about the idea of those rural communities or even, you know, communities that are populated, but they're spread across so much uh, land. That's where it's like, oh yeah, just the, the central hubs, whether it's, you know, a record store or a video rental store, just like those small little outposts of culture that people just tend to gravitate towards. Yeah. And I was uh, actually lucky in Regina that this guy, Derek Petrovich, the world's biggest headbanger who death actually gave them, gave him their banner because he was their biggest fan. Uh, He, yeah, because he was such a headbanger, a young guy working at a record store, he'd order all the metal mags from like, like Kerrang and metal forces, metal hammer. uh, You know, if it wasn't for him, I don't think any of us would have heard of all the bands. Like by the time I got to Winnipeg, even though I'm three years younger than Chris and George, I still listen to all the same bands because, because of Derek Petrovich. I love I love it when it is you can 
cite either specific people or specific, you know, things that you were exposed to that open up Pandora's box for you to be like, oh, yes, it's their fault that I got into the, <laughs> these bands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, like I could always count on him no matter what band would come. He'd be the first guy up there headbanging, you know, just he didn't he didn't care. Yeah. yeah. Like I wasn't friends with him, but I am now. I have like we're just from different parts of the city, you know, <laughs> in Regina, like it didn't have, I didn't have a car bus bus is impossible to use so yeah i just never hung around with them in my life but now i do actually i see i saw him in calgary last month that's so that's very cool that you could full circle it and be like i don't know if you know how influential you were to me <laughs> as a young headbanger yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh what was your family structure like growing up like brothers and sisters in the house what did your um you know mom and dad do for a living that sort of stuff uh, my dad was an x-ray technician and my mom sometimes taught like uh kids skating and stuff and my brother yeah and i have a brother got it and were you uh, this is another you know stereotype that happens with uh, most people in canada i presume the idea was like okay clearly todd is going to play hockey at some point like that is the sport you have to play um was that a were you a willing participant or was that something that you had to get pushed into uh, i didn't play hockey at all i have like no interest i played like just hockey in the alley but like again, and my brother, he's three years older than me too. So I had no chance of winning. So I just slash him and try to start fights and whatever. <laughs> sure. I, I, like I had no interest in the game at all. Just, I just like to fight and hit him with my stick and get beaten up and just get left in the snowbank. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're like, I like, I like the violence of it. I do not like anything about the actual sport. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And he's not a violent guy. I just like literally drive him insane. So. Uh, <laughs> sure sure <laughs> and then yeah but i actually my mom got me into speed skating and all that stuff which is you know going around and around on the track but i just wasn't into it so i quit that by the time i was like eight i think okay and what kind of just because i mean i only know you from uh you know watching your band perform uh many times there you, you seem generically speaking, a pretty, you know, sort of happy go lucky person. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, were you, has that kind of always been who you were or is that just, you know, obviously you're excited to play shows. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the role you inhibit. Uh, I would say that I am half happy go lucky, half morose and sad inside, like kind of the mix, you know? Sure. Uh, so I'd say like sort of that, but, like the shows, I just try to bring out the best of myself, no matter how I'm feeling, you know, like you just got to try to feel like a winner, even in no matter how you feel. So right, <laughs> just try to inspire other people, I suppose. Sure. I, I like that idea. Like feel like, feel like a winner, even though I may feel like a loser inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you, as you were going through, um, you know, elementary school and, and high school and everything like that, uh, were you, you know, were you into school? Did you have kind of a vision of the way that your life wanted to go as far as a career was concerned? Uh, I had no interest in anything except for, I would say, drawing and music. Other than that, like, uh, yeah, nothing. I didn't nothing. Like, didn't like school. Well, I'd play out sports with my brother because he wanted me so bad. So I played football with him and his friends. But again, they're older, so I just get totally creamed all the time. Like, it's just injuries like crazy. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'd play with that, but I don't, like, I kind of liked it. Like, I wouldn't call myself a jock for sure, but, like, I I played kind of sports, like hockey or football, I would say every day, even though I wasn't too into it. But what I was into was, yeah, like, drawing and music. i just sit there and do that. That's what, like, and I, and I like going down downtown, you know, like, just go into the record store and the comic store. I guess that's the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I like the consistency of uh, your interests has been always like, yes, I like uh, art and drawing and I like music. And that's been the way since I was eight years old or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I suppose I like walking too. I walk to and from school, no matter how far it was all the time, no matter what the weather. So I still walk all the time. Sure. That's good. <laughs> 
<laughs> I like I like that even in a um you know city that is uh, generally speaking pretty spread apart you're just like yeah I will just walk as many places as I can it's totally fine yeah for sure I I walk like in high school in sweatpants and minus forty like and came home for lunch every day going like I'd have to go down this long highway everything just like a few miles at least. Happy New Year. I am always excited to partner with my good friends at rockabilia.com. They have a promo code that you can use for 10% off your entire order. It is 100 words or less. Use that promo code and be able to buy all of the officially licensed band merch that your heart desires. I don't care if you're into Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses, Bring Me the Horizon, Perfect Circle, Tool, whatever it is. It, it, it's basically like your superstore in regards to officially licensed merch for bands of all shapes and sizes. Trust me, they have half a million items in stock. You can buy stuff for your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, everybody in between. And you can also have fun and purchase some stuff for yourself. Independently owned and operated, ships directly from the Midwest. I love what they do, and I think you will too. So go to rockabilia.com, use the promo code 100 words or less, 10% off your entire order. That's basically like, me giving you a free shirt if you buy like a hundred dollars worth of stuff. <laughs> you like how I how I phrase that? Like it's it's a free shirt. You just need to spend a hundred dollars. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Rockabilia, for your continued support. I love you. I love what you guys do. As you started to have the interest of music come into your life via you know your headbanger friend, and um, you probably were you. Uh, you know, getting influence from anywhere else in regards to, I mean, I know much music plays a part in many people's lives in Canada. Uh, was that also another jumping off point for you? Where were you getting all of these bands that you were uh, exposed to? Yeah, I watched, uh, yeah, Power Hour on Much Music. Totally. Yeah, that's where, like, you could see Razor, see Sacrifice videos, see uh, whatever, anything Voivod, Venom. All that stuff, yeah. I Celtic Frost, Circle of the Tyrants, and I taped them all the time. No matter how many times I had them on tape, I'd tape it again if I had to. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's like even if I have it, you never know when you're going to need another copy. Yeah, I, there was one night I, uh, my brother literally beat me out of the side of his car, out at the side door. <laughs> I fell into the snow, and he drove off. I was all sad. Walked all the way home in the snow, but then when I got home, my uh, my VCR had taped the new uh, Creator Toxic Trace video, and that's fucking <laughs> back on cloud nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, I thought tonight wasn't going to be good, but I think we're okay now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So w- once you started to, you know, really embrace music and like you said, you started to, you know, get into punk and hardcore stuff while you were also, you know, really uh, entrenched and engrossed with the metal side of things. Uh, I-, I know that can be um, kind of a-, a difficult thing for people to sort of cross over to because there was this really distinct line between like, yeah, you're either a, you know, a punker or a metalhead, like at- especially at that- during that time. Uh did you find it, I guess, easy for you to kind of bounce back and forth between the two because there wasn't a lot of outside influence for you kind of deciding a path or was it not even a concern of yours? Uh, well, the first metal band or the first punk bands that I heard, well, be, like the first ones were like Bow Wow Wow and the Ramones and Sex Pistols and stuff. But I literally had uh, zero interest in those bands, like less than zero, didn't care. But then I, uh, when I heard the accused and Daglo abortions and dead Kennedys, like the stuff that was more, uh, more metal, it just seemed like super raw metal, especially the accused and, uh, Daglo, like they just kind of blew my mind. I was like, okay, this shit's awesome. And then I, then I started getting into like, uh, COC animosity, which is the most at the time seemed like the craziest record of all time. Right. And, uh, like extreme noise terror. Like it was just, it was just an extension of metal to me. Like I, I almost think nowadays, like I was mistaken on what I thought punk was in a way, like, like none of the bands that people actually think are like straight up punk bands. I, I really wasn't interested in, in them, I suppose. And, right. oh, and then, but, it, but there was some like melodic bands and part of it is just cause they came to Regina, like the Doughboys that are from Montreal like they're one of my absolute favorite bands. And I I think they changed uh, how Chris and me probably played music for sure. Me 100%. Uh, 
Yeah, so it was like like the early Doughboys when I saw them. Like I remember sitting there, I was a kid, uh, like asking the bass player and shit, "Are you guys as fast as DRI?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, we are, we are." But like, <laughs> <laughs> like just to kind of humor me or whatever. Sure. But when we started playing, they're like not fast at all. They're just kind of this kind of melodic band, not not pop punk the way it sounds today, but just a more uh, uh, just people playing kind of music with a lot of heart and yet yeah, really really spoke to me and was the kind of the first band that wasn't metal or super heavy that I, I i was like oh maybe there is something that's not metal that i actually like in this universe <laughs> right what well, i also like that uh, articulation of what you were going through because i i think there's something that's so special about getting into music devoid of context where it's you know you don't have anybody telling you this is part of this scene and like this is a you know a true metal band and this is like oh this is grindcore it's just like well i don't know i'm just you know a, a kid i'm a teenager and yeah. you not you not being able to contextualize it makes it easier for you to hopefully listen to you know more styles of music but then ultimately still you know end up like oh yeah i'm, a, I'm you know i'm a punker with liberty spikes or like you know yeah i'm a metalhead with long hair or whatever yeah, well, I went to my first uh, punk shows with a mullet and a Metallica crash course and brain surgery shirt, and I actually had these punks like kicking me and stuff, calling me a poser, and I was just like, "Fuck you!" You're, you're right? <laughs> yeah, you're like I'm way older go. than me, but I, I remember thinking, "You're a fucking poser." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it did seem to me too, just like in hearing uh, you know other people speak about the experiences of uh, you know Winnipeg, where there did seem you know violence at the shows, and I know that during that time period, it was kind of emblematic of a lot of you know punk and metal shows in the eighties and stuff like that. Did you uh, did you experience that as well, where it was like, oh yeah, there's always going to be a fight at the show, kind of regardless of who's playing, as long as it's aggressive. No, I would say there wasn't too many fights, but like I had, I guess, two shows. Uh, one was, uh, yeah, Gangrene and the Goo Goo Dolls on their first tour ever. Yeah, that's where I was getting kicked. And then, yeah, there was a DRI show where I was getting beat up, but uh, right. it's kind of my own fault. So <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I, I see why I got punched. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> And so when you were getting more, you know, watching shows and being very immersed within that uh, music scene, did, uh, were your parents like, what the heck is Todd getting into? Like, why is he dressed up like this? Were they, you know, concerned about you or did they just let you do your thing because they saw that you cared about it? Uh, well, my dad didn't give a shit at all. Okay. Uh, and, uh, my mom just kind of would make fun of me kind of a little bit, but not okay. really. Like, I think, I think she was so worried about me becoming a, like an alcoholic or something of the such that I think she was like, if I take this or like, I can't take this away from him. Sort of like, I think she saw that, like, uh, that that was my life. Like I remember her, the only time she was concerned is I was drawing all the satanic shit watching, uh, or listening to venom, uh, at war with satan and i was so into it it's like a 15 minute satanic epic and i remember her just going oh i should pay more attention to what you're listening to and i was like ah go away whatever <laughs> right <laughs> that was our only uh our only uh whatever yeah i think she's probably i don't know like i like some of the things i was listening to like I, it's almost crazy like that it went under her radar you know sort of right and I, I'm guessing, because I know that uh, a lot of people have the experience of, you know, their parents start to see some, um, you know, le less than savory influences coming into their child's life, especially when you're talking about, you know, extreme metal and the, just the, you know, religious component can kind of come full circle where it's like, oh, we might not even be a household that's like going to church, but, you know, we sure as hell are not going to have, you know, a pentagram drawn on any of these records or anything. <laughs> yeah, I kind of... Uh... I almost felt like my mom had a rebellious side in her against religion and stuff herself. So seeing me like that, I almost felt like she was just like, uh, just like, ah, that's fine. Fuck it. You know? Right. right. 
<laughs> she's like, I noticed a little bit of me in him. That's great. Yeah, and I think like she knows none of us believe it. You know, so it's just to her, just uh, just a little bit of a re- rebellious imagery. But I think she would have been concerned if she knew what uh, like what was in Daglo lyrics. And <laughs> and I remember one time there's a video of you can actually see it on YouTube if you type in unlawful assembly. And Regina, it's like, you can see me stage diving in this red hoodie like a bunch of times. And I remember it came on TV on the public access station. And she's just like, like no parent at that time had seen stage diving and people going crazy like that. She's just like, what? I shouldn't let you do this. Like, oh, it's dangerous. You know what I mean? Like watch, like watching this, your kid stage jumping off the stage at a death metal show, you know, <laughs> right? Uh, she just kind of, they're almost like she'd mention it and then just kind of move on, you know, just keep an eye on it probably from a distance. Right. Yeah. It's like, if it gets any worse, then, you know, I'll intervene, but it, it seems like he's, you know, coming home with all of his limbs. So I think that's okay. Yeah. And so excited, you know, like every that's time, true. Like that was the best day of my life. The best night of my life. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, and literally they were like seeing us in a few, no means no sacrifice razor. Like there's literally the best days of my life beyond possession. So like, I wasn't lying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Over breakfast the next morning, you're just like, yeah, like I, I think I've peaked. Like there's, there's no way that a show could get any better. Your parents are like, wow, that's great. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's partially true. Like, yeah. I can see like, I don't know if anything's ever captured. Well, I'm sure it has, but for me, like it's very hard to capture that, uh, the essence of like SNFU in their prime. Like <laughs> lots of people have tried. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very, it's difficult to have perspective because you can't help, but put the rose colored glasses on and nostalgia washes over you and all of that, all those feelings. But then, you know, when you're getting down to it, it's just like, yeah, but that was literally the first time that I saw SNFU. So, like, <laughs> I don't know if I could duplicate that ever. Yeah, and they were like, they were still amazing. Like, like a year before, like Chai Pig died. You know what I mean? So yeah. It's like, like he's like he's still this amazing on his deathbed. Imagine him when he was like twenty one and healthy. You know. Hey there, I'm excited to partner up with Mutant League Records. It was a great record label based out of the greater Chicago, Illinois area. They released some high quality punk, hardcore adjacent. Like, you know, if you're thinking you like the stuff fast and aggressive, that is exactly what they do with a lot of melody. That is also what they do. But I want to talk specifically about a band they work with called With the Punches. They haven't released any new music since 2015. And this EP is a banger. Let me just play one of their songs called Mirage right now and you'll get a vibe of it and then i'll let you know what to do in order to consume more there you have it it really gives me some like classic 2010 vibes of you know when pop punk was really just reinventing reinvigorating itself that's uh, that's what this band gives me a vibe for so i will include a link in the show notes you can stream this entire ep that came out in mutant league records and uh yeah just enjoy with the punches because they're putting out new music and that's a great thing so visit mutantleaguerecords.com you'll be able to find all of the cool products they have there and you'll be able to consume even more bands like with the punches than you could possibly shake a stick at but anyways, thank you very much, Mutant League Records, and go check out With the Punches. Once you started to see bands and, you know, watch them play right in front of you, did you immediately get taken by the idea of playing in a band? Were you already playing, you know, bass as you started to go to shows, or where did that drop into your uh, lap? Yeah, I was taken, like, way before that. Like, Okay. I was taken, like, 100% when I heard Kiss, like, the first time. I was just like, there's nothing like this. Nothing. I, I searched everywhere in the world for something that exciting, and I, I couldn't. And my friend across the alley, he, him and his dad were amazing guitar players and still are, like, 10,000 times better than I'll ever be. And, like, like, just the fact that they were doing it, I thought maybe I can too. And, like, I tried, and I sucked shit, but I just stayed at it. Like, I, I couldn't quit no matter how bad I was. Like, 
like I'm literally, literally not a, like a natural musician. I just like, just kind of work hard at it, you know? So right. I was kind of those two guys make like, like I knew, I knew, like I had no other thought in my head besides I got to be in a band and draw. Like never, ever. I never wanted to be anything else. Right. <laughs> no plan, no plan B. Just one of, one of these artistic pursuits will uh, carry me through my life, whether, wh- whatever that means. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, yeah. there's no other thing that I ever wanted to be, which right. is maybe, maybe land, but that's just the way it is. No, that's it. It's, that's how you were built. Uh, like you said, making the move to Winnipeg and I spy collectively wanted to do that. Correct. Like all of you guys were in Regina and then you decided to move to Winnipeg. Uh, I moved to Winnipeg on my own. And okay. Then, uh, yeah. And then I went back. I didn't even know those guys. I moved to Winnipeg. I'd seen their band. They were doing a cover of Aces High by Iron Maiden. Okay. When I was, go- when I was going to go back for the summer to Regina, I was asked my friend Marlon, I was like, you know those guys? And uh, he did. And I was like, ask them if they want to like be in a band with me. And then I went and jammed with them. I was just like, I had I had a song ready. I was just like, here, you guys like this song? And I like, literally showed it to them in whatever, a few minutes. Rary, the guitar player, they're both good guitar players, great drummer. And it's just uh, like within seconds, we were playing the song. And I was just like, I think we all felt like this is – this rules, you know, and I jumped off, uh, the drummer's mom's, uh, coach. I hit my head on the roof, knocked myself unconscious. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. From then, yeah. Then those guys followed me to Winnipeg eventually. That's, oh, that, that's cool. That's, I, I really like that. I just like the idea. Hey, do you think maybe like you'd want to start a band with me? <laughs> just like that, that audacity to, you know, ask someone where it's like, Oh, Hey, hey well, you want to do this? And it's like, you know, I, I'm not, maybe I'm not that good, but like, still it'll be fun. Yeah. It was kind of, uh, yeah, it was interesting how, how they just, uh, I think that they, like they had a different guy who was writing their songs and singing. And I think he just happened to have quit like right when I asked them. So they're like, yeah, we need another guy. And then I got there and for some reason we all just like 100% clicked like, like I like we just felt like this is fucking fun as fuck. Right. Yeah, it's like everybody everybody collectively was like, Oh yeah, this is the right fit. Like this is perfect. Yeah, yeah. And they all listen obviously to the same bands because they're from Regina. So whatever bands came through Regina got the listeners. So we all had listened to the same bands. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, you were all experiencing the same thing, except you didn't know each other before that. It's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like they actually live on the other side of the city from me, so I I didn't know them at all. I didn't recognize them from shows except for the one show I saw them play that their maiden cover. Right. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and I know like when you, uh, when you joined Propagandi and, you know, this, cause that was like 97 ish or 98 ish or something like that. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 96 actually. 96. Okay. So, you know, I mean, you like clearly Propagandi had already made, you know, an impact in your area and all, already started to, you know, be able to tour. And like you said, you know, have those experiences outside of uh, your hometown uh, or outside of Winnipeg. Was it, um, I know they were your friends and you were excited to, you know, join, but was it, uh, I guess, intimidating for you to kind of like step on, you know, a more quote unquote professional band. And I'm using air quotes in there just because, you know, I'm sure at the time no one would have defined themselves as professional, but uh, was it, I guess, were you nervous at all? I would say like, uh, like I'd already like I spy and propaganda had already done a 10 inch record together. We'd already toured together twice. I'd already, like I sang a couple songs on stage with them in Brandon. Like we were such, I lived with Chris, like we were such so close in a way that it, uh, didn't, uh, like I wouldn't say I felt like I was in them, but I was like, uh, you know what I mean? Like all the songs on Last Talk, I, I was in the same house while Chris wrote them, you know, like you'd go up, you know, I could hear him playing his riffs all day, go up, listen to his four track. So I just kind of already felt like, I wouldn't say it was like this big jump where it was like, oh, suddenly I'm in this band, you know, I was like, just do you want to learn these songs? Okay. And then 
yeah, we just started playing and <laughs> it just kept going. <laughs> right. It's like I was already existing in and around the band. It just felt like I already knew all of the comings and going. So yeah, now it just makes sense that I, I joined the band if given an opportunity. Yeah, I felt, and it did feel like uh, kind of like probably broader doors are opening for myself, especially because the guys in I Spy always seem to have completely lost interest a little bit, you know? So right. two guys quit and, you know, uh, yeah. And then, so it's just kind of me and the drummer and my friend, Sean, who was an awesome guy, but I, and great at bass. I just, I just felt like it was like, kind of like, oh, this is kind of dying a little bit, uh, uh, just because of interest, you know? And then, right. Yeah. I thought of when Chris asked me to play bass, like, and I, I was supposed to just be like a fill in just for a little bit, but I just kept going and going. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fortunately you're not the new guy anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> did uh so how did you take i mean like you said i know that you uh went out with uh i spy before and how did you take to more intense touring you know like when you were out for prolonged periods at a time and you know doing more uh extended runs did you like it was it something that you had to grow accustomed to uh well actually the it was actually less i spy played more sh- i played longer shows with i spy than with propaganda so it was uh Okay. Uh, or longer tours, yeah. So it was like, that was the same. And I guess I forgot to mention, yeah, too, me, James from I Spy, and Chris also used to play together, too. So, uh, yeah. So I don't know. Another connection. Playing music with Chris. <laughs> right, right, right. So so I, I guess I can rephrase that where it's like, when you started to tour with I Spy, was it, did you immediately take to the road? I had never been anywhere in my life. Uh, except for I went to Disneyland when I was a kid. Uh, so I found it completely interesting. Like we just traveled in a suburb with I Spy, just in a suburban. Like it was the first time I ever saw anything. So uh, Right. Yeah. It was all exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. And you're delusional. Like when you're that young, like we played a couple shows where there was three people there and like literally did not give a shit. Like we're just playing as hard as we can, not even noticing really that there's three people, you know? <laughs> right. It's a glorified practice at that point. Yeah. It's like irrelevant. Sure. I, yeah. It's weird. <laughs> um, and I know because, uh, I mean, you have been, I mean, with propaganda and then obviously with I spy as well, there's, you know, clearly been a political discourse with the band and, you know, I mean, obviously animal rights is a huge centerpiece of you know, who you are as a human being. When did those ideas start to, I, I guess, come into your consciousness? Cause I mean, you know, most people can point to metal as being, you know, not the most uh, socially conscious, you know, music style. So like, was it when you started to get exposed to, you know, like punk and hardcore bands that were espousing those messages or where did it come into your life? Uh, I guess the first person I ever knew was my friend's aunt just happened to be a vegetarian. Uh, so that was the first time I ever really thought about it. And okay. then, yeah, I think MDC, like they had some vegetarian songs. And then I guess the one that caught me the most was that song, No More by Youth of Today. It's uh, really yeah. raw. Uh, <laughs> like when I first got that record, I thought, oh, fuck, I wasted my money. But then... I listen to it every day on my way to school, just back and forth. And fuck, I started to think this is the greatest record, actually. And I still, I still think like despite it being like a straight edge record, it's like it's literally one of the best hardcore records ever. I think like we're not in this alone. That record, yeah, it's an incredible record. I agree. Yeah, it's, it has so much heart and so much uh, fire to it. Uh, yeah, I think that song, and then yeah, I moved to Winnipeg and. There's propaganda. Those guys were vegetarians. Uh, I lived with this guy from India who was a vegetarian. Yeah, and I just told him one day, I'm, as soon as Christmas is over, I'm going to be a vegetarian too. And he was like, oh, you're not going to last. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going to last. You watch. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Because I do think that happens for many people that you know go vegetarian or vegan at a earlier age whether it's their parents or friends or whatever it's always that notion it's like yeah yeah talk to me in a year or whatever (laughs) and then almost out of spite you're like 
I'm going to do this regardless of what they say. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on like who you are. Like if you're doing it, like if all your friends are vegetarian, that's why you're doing it. But for me, I was like, just I, I'm tired of hurting animals. Don't want to. If I can help it and avoid it, I will. You know? Right. Yeah. It meant nothing to me. I like, like I went vegetarian. It was like hundred percent no problem. Never cared. Never thought about meat again. And when I went vegan, I never, I never had any desire ever again in my life to ever want any of that shit. Just, just gone. I don't know why. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, the, the, the proverbial statement, cold turkey, <laughs> even though it's, yeah, uh, you know, ironic, it definitely feels, uh, especially once people, like you said, either get into it for, you know, they may get exposed by their friends, but then they actually find out the reasoning behind why people make those decisions. That's kind of where it gets really cemented in place. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm never going to be that again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, the what I, I I mean I've spoken to you know Chris and uh, a little bit in regards to uh, you know John as well with his experience, but I know in the late '90s there was this push and pull with people you know getting into propaganda for just I mean you know they liked the music but then they were also put off by the politics where it's just like oh you know I mean and clearly you guys have made uh, no bones about those people that. <laughs> you know, uh, just want to listen to you for your music and don't want to hear your politics. Um, how, how did you, like you personally, as you guys started to, you know, play in front of audiences that might have no context for who you guys are. And then you get up there and, you know, you say a few things on stage or whatever. How did you personally kind of navigate that? Were you just like, well, I don't care what the audience thinks. Like <laughs> we're going to do this because this is who we are. Or how did you, I guess, process that as it was, as it was happening? Uh, I guess it's just you just, <laughs> I think it's like less thought about than that thought out than that. I think it's just like, here's our band. Here's what we have to say. We're playing music and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> sure. Like, like that's the way punk bands always were. You have your songs, you have what you say or don't say. And uh, like to me, punk bands, were somewhat political like that's just the way they were like even bands like Daglo, like they were if you read the lyrics they're political like uh or doughboys like that's just i thought punk bands were political bands you know like i the other ones i didn't listen to so i don't even know what they are or, you know sure sure like, to me, actually the only band that wasn't really political was the descendants and i did listen to them and like them but uh, even they had some of that, you know, they're just, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They were little, they were, um, I, I, I see where you're coming from in regards to like these bands may not have been, you know, overtly political, but they were making their beliefs known in, you know, maybe more subtle ways than, you know, what you guys were doing. Yeah, exactly. And, and in the ni early nineties, there's like Los Crudos, Born Against, Man Lifting Banners, Spit Boy, uh, like all the shit going on and uh, like uh, those were the bands super exciting to me too. Evilgreed.net. What are they? Question mark. They are an amazing web store solution for bands of all shapes and sizes based in Berlin, Germany. But what does that mean to you? Who's maybe not in a band. You were able to purchase stuff directly from their site and it will ship to you lickety split. And what's cool about this company is that they are a highly curated, they work like kind of like a record label, where they only work with a small handful of labels and bands that really have either a similar vibe, maybe not musically, but just like philosophically. And like, let me just throw some of these band names out there. And that way it can give you a good idea of what they got going on. They work with bands like End and Gate Creeper, Power Trip, Amon Ra, Bell Witch, Deaf Heaven, Nails, you can kind of see what they're, do, what they're working with. But before you do anything else, you need to use this promo code 100 words that gets you 10% off your entire order. And I know you may be thinking, hey, they're based in Berlin, Germany. Isn't shipping going to be ridiculously expensive? No, that is why they are working with this very podcast, because they want more people in the US. And frankly, the way that exchange rates work right now is it is into our advantage here in the States to order from them and it will ship out to you and it will get to you in record time. Pardon the pun because we're talking about records. They also sell records, but it will get to you very quickly. I've ordered from them and honestly, 
around a week lands on your doorstep, it's perfect. It's great. So go to evilgreed.net, use the promo code 100 words and find some of your new favorite merch and bands and clothing items and you will go home happy even though you're not technically leaving, but you get the point. evilgreed.net, 100 words is the promo code. There's never been a better time for football fans to join the huddle with BetMGM. Sign up today and place a $10 pregame wager on any pro football team to win. If any player scores a touchdown in any pro football game, you'll win $200 in free bets regardless of your wager's outcome. Just use bonus code JERSEY200 when you make your first bet. Get on the field and find out why nothing beats a win with the king of sportsbooks. Download the app or go to betmgm.com and use bonus code JERSEY200 to win $200 in free bets if any player scores a touchdown in any pro football game. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I know you, you actually mentioned that, I know, in other interviews where the whole ebullition scene uh, really captured your attention as well. And I know, I mean, being from Southern California, that really you know captured my imagination as well. And seeing those bands play live was always so inspiring. Yeah. Um, how, like, was it, um, I guess, how did you get into those bands? Was it just like, you know, simply seeing their names out there and you started to get into that? Because ebullition, like, I, I know that it's, a lot of people it was very influential for, but a lot of it didn't necessarily travel too far outside of their respective areas. Yeah. Um, my friend, Sam Smith, who actually wrote for us for a while and whatever, but he's like a kind of a promoter. Somehow he got a hold of the evolution order sheet. Uh, that's when we actually lived, me, him and Chris, and he ordered the man lifting banner record just for no reason. Okay. And, uh, when we put it on, I was like, fuck is that? <laughs> right. Awesome. You know? And, uh, and then like, there was just like me one year, one brief year where it was man lifting banner born against, uh, uh down cats, like it, everything awesome came out all at once. And then even like, I like get, it, it turned, uh, like the second wave was so much less interesting. Like it had already, already dissipated and died like within like a year and a half. Uh, or at least my interest in it, you know, it turned more into like less politics, more people just uh, trying to go as crazy as they can, throwing a fit, laying on the stage, crying at the end of the show, <laughs> like, you know, fashionable, you know, like, basement shows suddenly fashionable and everyone kind of dressed like a uh, nation of Ulysses or whatever. And, yep. Uh, no, I have nothing against them, but everyone was copying that. And uh, I don't know. I just lost interest, you know, just like, okay, I've moved on. And sure. I think that was the last, <laughs> sadly, maybe the last true interest in, or when, Punk stop feeling fresh to me, I would say. Not not the last interest, but like the the last super, 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 super interesting wave where I was like, I fucking love this, you know? Right. Like a, a proverbial scene kind of washed over you and you're like, I can't get enough of this. Yeah. And then but and then obviously I like kept loving No Means No as Nephew and Sure. Like all all the bands, like I still listen to Man Lifting Banner quite often. I'm just like, this is the best fucking record ever. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. When, uh, so I, I know that the uh, propaganda, I mean, that's been a mainstay from a musical perspective for you for, you know, many, many years. And uh, when did, because a lot of bands, you know, especially as you went through the 90s, had to make these, you know, decisions of, all right, are we, you know, a, <laughs> are we going to go for it? Are we a, a mainstream punk band? Are we going to, you know, join the likes of, you know, Green Day and Rancid and stuff like that? And, um, you know, sometimes those decisions worked well and other times they did not. I know you guys always deliberately, you know, <laughs> erred on the side of caution and you, <laughs> you were not interested in, you know, participating in a lot of those uh, yeah. systems. But, you know, I, I'm sure that there were super random opportunities, whether it was like 
you know, maybe it's signing to a record label beyond fat or whether it's, you know, like, Hey, you want to use this song in a video game and like having those discussions. Um, do you have any interesting kind of anecdotes as I sort of talk through those random experiences that uh, stick out to you where you're like, Oh yeah, we had to say no to this, even though, you know, it could have paid us a lot of money or whatever. I remember there's always just labels and shows and whatever. And yeah, it was just, uh, none of us even really looked or took it seriously. Like we just had no interest. Like, I really feel like it's our age and the area we came up. Like, people, like, nowadays, if you get into music, like, probably the first bands you got into were kind of the corporate bands like Green Day and The Offspring and all that, you know? Whereas for us, that was, like, the signal of the the end of the good times, you know? Like, just this shit, this stuff all kind of, like, tanked, <laughs> like, right. in, as far as the spirit of it, you know? Uh, I think in the 80s, like, no one could really have a career or, like, it didn't seem like there was really a a mass audience for any of it. So it was all just seemed so kind of pure, you know, the spirit of it. And people can say what they want. People think, well, yeah, bands deserve to make money and blah, blah, blah. There's, like, books about being sellouts and stuff now with people analyzing it. But to me... Like, it doesn't matter what I think or whatever. I just find that that's uh, just ended for me. Like, it, my spirit as like, I still feel it. Like, I still feel like, like, kind of all this is kind of a shit joke, right? Because all these people, like, everyone's trying to charge six bucks in fucking the 80s and 90s to save everyone money so everyone can go. And then all those people now are paying fucking $800 to see Rage Against the Machine and the off not the offspring, but, like, Right. Any band that went away and came back, you know, okay, I'll pay hundred bucks to see that, you know, and it's just everyone's caught in this thing and you can't get a like it's so hard to get away from Ticketmaster and Facebook and Instagram and just like, everything's so far diluted and gone to hell. Like you like the world's changed so much that I can't even figure the way I fit into it in a way that I like, you know what I mean? Sure. No, it's, um, it's it, it, I mean, it, it is that sort of existential question of the, like, where is my own line? Like sometimes I, you know, I draw a line and then it can kind of move for one reason or another. And then will I move it back to there? Or just like, it's your comfort level is always defined by, uh, you know, the extenuating circumstances around you. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, it's always like, clear to us that like like we lose like we lose hundreds of thousands of dollars like not taking certain shows and that because there's sponsors you know but then you know no one no one truly no one no one no one gives a fuck and you can't avoid it on all the any social media platforms you can't avoid it even going on the uh, internet uh like we're aware no no bands care if they're shirts are made in Haiti. Nobody cares about anything. And it's like, fuck this, you know, like sometimes I literally feel that. And I don't mean I'm above it or anything. It's just like, literally, literally, like I often, often I'm just like, fuck you. Fuck this. <laughs> right. Like I sort of wash my hands of all of this. <laughs> yeah. And like, but trying to hang in there, you know? Sure. Like, I think we all hang in there for the music and hopefully the people and, uh, uh, I yeah, just yeah. Hopefully spread some kind of spirit. Like that's what I say. Like you know what I mean. It's a mix of happy go lucky and morose. Just like sure, I, I can't see anyone with a brain existing now that doesn't feel that way. Like no matter what they think, like whether you're a conspiracy theorist or a religious person or a Winnipeg dingbat or <laughs> like I can't see anybody with a thinking brain not being partially depressed by watching the entire world go down the tube. Sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, and I think that's a, again, that existential crisis that I think most people use so many aspects of their life to distract from that ultimate question of just like, what, what the hell is this happening? Like <laughs> I have all these bells and whistles in my life, but like, is this actually the thing? Like what, what do I care about? And I think that's to your point, what you, ultimately the articulation of that is difficult to arrive at 
you're like, I'm not better than it, but I know I don't want to participate in that. So what does that mean? <laughs> Where do yeah. I go? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> um, when, you know, kind of going along those same lines, like, you know, I know that you guys have been able to, you know, subsist as the band and still exist and obviously make money off it, but with a level that you guys are comfortable at where you can tour when you need to and tour when you want to, but not make it this like really backbreaking thing where you have to be out on the road 300 plus days out of the year or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, for you, when did it, uh, you know, when did the band become, uh, for lack of a better term, like serious where it was like, Oh wow. Like I can't believe that I'm technically like a full-time musician or whatever, or has that even, or is that even a thought process that triggers in your head? Uh, the first time that happened, I guess for me, the crossover was the second I joined Propaganda. Cause okay. they, <laughs> sure. they gave me 666 bucks and I was like, holy fuck, I'm rich. <laughs> Literally like I was like, Every problem I have in the world is over. Like I felt like I was fucking rich as fuck. Right. That's amazing. I love how they gave you six hundred sixty-six dollars. That's like so perfect. And I, and I remember me and Chris talking. He was like, "They were going to give me a thousand, and somehow, as we discussed it, we got down to six hundred sixty-six bucks." And I thought, "Oh, this is so awesome." <laughs> You're like, "They get me. They really get me." <laughs> yeah, it's a weird discussion, I guess. <laughs> Be right. Funnier, be funnier if it's six hundred sixty-six. So that so that was the ultimate jumping off point, and then like everything that you have you know uh, experienced since then, from like getting a uh, quarter quarterly royalty check or whatever, has been like, wow, this is ridiculous. I can't believe I'm getting this. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's not like much, you know. Like we're still like, uh, yeah, you're a working you know, class band. Yeah, people, like the people working on the house next to my house here are making fucking. 10, 20, no, probably not that much, but like <laughs> three or three times as much as I am per year or whatever. So that's like, right. I always think too, but then they're actually having to work on that house and I'm not, so whatever. Right. It's a trade off. Like we work hard. Like we practice every, every day, play guitar every day. When I'm not playing guitar, I draw, you know, like, but like just the arts uh, is not awarded in this world. It's either awarded like you're a mega millionaire. Or you're not, you know? Yeah, it, there definitely is a, a a hard in between that exists where it's like, I, you know, could be working at a local coffee shop and obviously making more money than I'm, I'm doing currently. And no shots against people that make coffee in coffee shops because that's an important part of our lives. But yeah, just that idea of like, okay, I'm, you know, barely making minimum wage, all things considered. Yeah, exactly. And you just have to decide for yourself, like, uh you like i've never been a really money driven person so it's just whatever you know yeah okay. right like i just like i just do i don't know i try not to think about it sure sure i, I get that and like you said if you're not uh, you know playing guitar or touring and stuff like that visual art has always been a part of your life like you said ever since you were very young yeah. when did you feel like you could call yourself an artist and i know that's kind of a, a big slash maybe silly question but just like when did you feel like you could uh you know display yourself out there like that uh, i guess just whenever instagram showed up i was just like oh, i guess i'll throw, start throwing some shit on there other than that i just yeah, I never. I just drew for myself. I still do. Like I'm, most things, I draw. I don't put on Instagram. Just every now and then, throw something on there. So uh, that's the first time. Like I've never put art anywhere or anything. Just yeah. Got care. it. Yeah. No, that's cool because I, I didn't. I uh, that was my interaction with you in regards to that, where I was like, oh, that's cool. I did not really have an inclination that that was something that you were doing and wanted to actively share. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, and I guess record covers, right? So, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, something that I always, uh, it kind of sticks in my craw when at any time a people interview you or Chris in the band where, uh, you know, p- people ask, or it's like, oh, things are worse than they ever have been. Like, you know, do you feel like you've even made a difference? <laughs> it's just, it's that sort of like, you know, yeah. button pressing question that people like to pose. Um, and obviously the idea of like, well, I can't prove that something didn't work. <laughs> Like there's probably people who have been influenced by us that I, I'm never going to meet or know. Um, 
is that <laughs> i guess there's maybe no real question contained in this besides the fact like is that uh you know do you find that question happening more or less or is it people that still just are like oh yeah well you guys sung about all these political things now none of them, none of it worked do you even should you even exist anymore is that annoying <laughs> okay. uh well it's not a unreasonable question I think. sure i'd say uh i'd say probably at least in terms of like uh like veganism and stuff at least may probably somebody somewhere went vegan because of the band or something but i would also say like like you know as far as what we did but if we're doing it or we have something to say like if it doesn't speak to people it doesn't you know and i guess it never compelled really anybody to try to even not have sweatshirt you know, like we always thought maybe if we do it like other bands, like kind of the bigger bands will follow suit, you know, but no, they don't, nobody cares. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, so I don't know. Maybe what we, we just don't say it in a compelling enough way. Maybe people don't care. Uh, maybe, you know what I mean? We're just, as far as we're concerned, we just have our songs, play them, say what we want to say. Uh I have no reason to expect someone to listen to me over uh, like there's superstars in the world. You know, there's Michael Jackson, like there's, uh, you know what I mean? Shania Twain, people who can out sing us by 10 million miles. Queens, right? Dio, uh, you know, sure. We have, we have our songs. We know we're not superstars. We know we're not anything like, you know what I mean? Sure. Just fucking guys. Like if you want to, play guitar 10 times as good as us listen to dream theater you want to uh have twice as good of politics read a book <laughs> i don't know you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah you're like you know if you want a subpar version of all of those things together just go ahead and listen to our band we're a perfect perfect match for you <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> that's, that's all you can do you know you're just like we're just prairie guys <laughs> like what can i say you know yeah. Well, and and I think too, it's like that, that notion of you guys being able to carve your own path and be able to exist where people have paid attention to you and still continue to pay attention to you, whether or not they, you know, even frankly care about your new records. If it's just like, oh yeah, like, you know, Victory Lap is the record for me and like everything else prior to that sucks or whatever. <laughs> like just at least you have, you know, the, the, the longevity and the stick to itiveness that you guys have had where it's like, all right, like whether you like us or not, you need to form an opinion of us. <laughs> and, yeah, like that's, that's important. important. That's an important fact. Like, well, not really because like most of the world has no idea who we are. That's, uh, that's true. I'll, I'll on the street in Winnipeg. I could see 10,000 people every day who don't recognize me in any single form in my, in my own small city. So <laughs> if, we, if I was to go to London, you know what I mean? It's like people can ignore, they can avoid, they can. <laughs> it's know? true. It's true. I, I, the one thing that we have and every artist has is that no one can be you. So like the only person who can make my songs is me. So like no people who write books can't do it. Dream Theater can't do it. No means no can't do it. SNFU can't do it. Like they can't make my songs. They can't make Chris's songs. A band can try to copy Chris. I've heard 10 million people try to copy Chris, and they can't. It doesn't sound like him. It doesn't sound like propaganda. It doesn't sound like his voice. The lyrics don't work. So that's that's what you have. All you have is yourself. Uh, that you know, people are either into it or they're not. If they hear it, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally understand. I mean, the yeah, that idea that it's like you're. <laughs> this stew and combination of all of you individuals coming together to form this band. Like, you know, there's this litany of things that makes you guys unique. And it's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that is, that's what's going to come out regardless of whatever we try to do. This mm -hmm. is what's going to be presented as the, 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 the structure that we have built. Yeah. And I would say like, you know, un unless you stood in front of sacrifice in razor in the eighties, 
you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like this is a unique yeah. experience. <laughs> the, it started getting ridiculous there. No, no, for sure. Well, the last thing I'll I'll ask you, just because I I am curious, the uh, and I know you've articulated it probably in other places, but the uh, the rod is your nickname. Uh, I'm oh, yeah, sure there's yeah. I'm sure there's a absolutely stupid reason for that, but I I I, I am very curious myself. Yeah, well, when I was a kid, I my brother started calling me the rod, and he write my name with this like long like uh, piece of iron iron rod under it, you know. <laughs> Uh, okay yeah, that's it that's just kind of just kept going and going and then when i went to winnipeg this guy simon hughes uh i don't know somehow he he saw something from my brother that said the rod on it and then he started calling me the rod and then everyone did yeah. <laughs> that everyone did I, yeah. like, so the, was it usually in reference like was it todd the rod or did people just be like the rod uh yeah just the rod like simon would call me like he'd go and what are you doing the rod <laughs> like that <laughs> that's that's, okay. that's beautiful and then a lot of people just say like like if they're talking about me they'll say the rod but if they're talking to me they say rod you know like jordan chris they just say rod right <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect so like no one in very rare instances do people actually call you todd uh well nah so a lot of people still do you know Sure. Yeah, it's your you know God given like, person. Like a lot of people I know have nothing to do with music. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it'd be weird if they called you Rod. You'd be like, no, that's that's that, that not in this yeah, side of my life. Yeah, they don't even know. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you again to Todd from one of my all time favorite bands ever, Todd Kowalski from Propagandi. He's great, and thank you very much for spending time with me one beautiful afternoon over the computer. Next week, I have another another great chat. We're sorry, episode 536. Man, every time I read those numbers, I'm like, I can't believe I've been doing this for you know the better part of, it's almost as old as my child, this podcast. But anyways, I have Jacob Duarte, who plays an amazing band called Narrowhead. He also has played in a bunch of other cool Texas-based hardcore bands like Scourge, and uh, there's, I'm missing a few others, but you get the point. But the reason he came on the podcast is because Narrowhead is releasing a new record soon. And to be honest, I kind of, I, I dragged my feet on Narrowhead. I was like, ah, they're cool. Like when I, I first started to hear their name out there. And then uh, now this new LP has made me a full convert of them. Really big fan. So I had to have Jacob on the show. But that is what we got next week where we get to talk a lot about Texas hardcore and, you know, other fun subjects like that. So until then, please be safe, everybody. Hey, Nets fans, on game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. When cooking isn't in the cards, go Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. Get your food delivered on time at the lowest price with Grubhub. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. Ugh, I wish I owned a car. It'd make weekend day trips, seeing the fam, and last-minute errands so much easier. You don't need to own a car for that. Really? Check out Zipcar. They let you book cars from your phone 24-7. It's super affordable, because you only pay for the time you need, plus gas and maintenance are included. Yeah, but bet it costs more in the long run. Nope. Members save hundreds a month compared to car owners. Okay, I'm checking them out. Use the Zipcar app to book a car near you in minutes. For a few hours or a weekend, join instantly at Zipcar.com. Zipcar. You don't need to own a car to have one. So, tell me about last night. Well, it wasn't what I expected. It had the perfect amount of spice. Sounds hot. It had all the flavor, and I wanted more. The ghost pepper wings from Popeye's are just so delicious. Wait, I thought you were talking about your date. Sometimes, things aren't always as they seem. Like Popeye's ghost pepper wings that have the perfect level of kick and flavor. Try them for only $5 today. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Price may vary. Tax extra. Love that chicken from Popeye's.